Okay, one of the first things we're going to need to know when we study strength of materials is how to calculate the change in length in a, an axial member. An axial member is one where, like, uh, one of my examples sitting here. This is an axial member, all right? This is just a little stick of wood. I have a guitar making lab here, and this, this is a, came out of my guitar lab. I made this out of a piece of wood that didn't go into a guitar. All right, it has, it's basically axial. There's, there's the, the length dimension is much, much longer than either of the cross-sectional dimensions. So when I pull on this, it's going to stretch. Now, typically we use metal in uh, most of the structures we're going to work with, or plastic perhaps. This is a piece of brass brazing rod, and I've got little handles bent onto it. So if I pull like that, I'm stretching this piece of brass rod. Now I'm not stretching it very much because this is really stiff. Um, an example of something that a middle-aged professor can stretch is a piece of bungee cord. Now if I stretch that, apply a force to that, I get a very uh, significant deformation. The nice part about this is it doesn't matter whether I'm dealing with my piece of wood, my piece of brass rod, or my bungee cord. If I know a couple of basic things about my material, I can calculate this, the change in length due to a given force. Okay, so what I've got here is let's say we've got a one meter, meter long rod that's round and it's three millimeters in diameter and there's a force of 350 newtons being applied to the end. So let's figure out what the change in length is. Now, before we, we can do this, we have to have a governing expression. Now you can go ahead and just look it up in your book. It's certainly in there. Or let's, let's take a slightly more interesting approach and let's work it out for ourselves. Now, I've done this a zillion times. Likely this is the first time you've ever seen this or one of the first times you've ever seen this. If you don't know where my, my argument is headed, don't worry about it. If I, I know where it is, if I don't know, something's wrong here. There's no reason you would know right now. So if you get a little uh, confused about where I'm headed, don't worry about it. Just, just uh, follow along and you'll see where you get in the end. We're going to need three expressions here. The first one we're going to need is the definition of strain, which is change in length over length. Over, un, over original length. The next thing I'm going to need is the definition stress, which is force over area. And we have a force, and we'll figure out an area here in a minute. And the last thing we need is Hooke's law, which relates stress to strain. Now, the relationship between stress and strain, again, assuming we've got a linear material, we're still in the elastic region is the proportionality constant there is E. That's a stiffness. That's the elastic modulus, and every material has its own elastic modulus. The elastic modulus of this wood is, is fairly low compared to a metal, compared to my brass. For my brass, the elastic modulus of this is, about, is in between the elastic modulus of steel and aluminum, probably. There's different types of brass. And the elastic modulus for my uh, bungee cord is lower than for, my, for, for wood. The reason I can stretch that bungee cord is the elastic modulus is very low. Okay, so we've got these three, now what? What we're going to do is we're going to start doing a little bit of substitution here. Um, I can't help noticing the right side of this equation and the right side of this equation both equal stress. Well, if this equals stress and this equals stress, then those two must equal each other. So let's start there. Let's say F over A equals E times strain. All right, so far so good. Now what? Let's take one last step here. We have strain there, and we have this expression for strain right here. So let's put that in there, too. So now we've got, let's forget this middle part, we don't need that anymore. Let's look at this part and that part, and let's make them equal to one another. All right, you can see we're almost there. If I can put this on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side of the equal sign, I'm in business. So let's see, delta L must equal F L over A E. Okay. That's the thing we need to know. This is certainly in your book somewhere. All right. 
So that's the uh, the expression that we're going to call the governing expression. So I'm going to get rid of that minus of that question mark up there, and I'm going to write F L over A E. Now I got to erase this because I have a small board. Okay. Well, let's see. We can either know or can figure out everything on this side of the equation, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So I think we've got a well-defined problem here. The only thing we don't know right now is area, so let's work that out. The area, there's two expressions, and normally we teach area as pi r squared, and that's certainly correct. But when we're doing problems like this, we're usually given diameters, not areas. So let's go ahead and write area as pi over 4 times diameter squared. Rather than having to convert to area, let's just use diameter uh, directly. So pi over 4 times 0 0.003 meters squared. Okay. And I'm going to do everything in meters here. I find if I keep consistent units through the problem, I make fewer mistakes. Hard to believe a professor would ever make a mistake, huh? If you work that out, you get 7.0686 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. Okay, so that's our area. We know that now. I'm going to write that up here. Okay, very small number. This is one of the things about the metric system that I have to explain to my American students is you get really, really big or really, really small numbers as a matter of course. In the English system of units, which has very little to recommend it, by the way, you get a number that small, that's unusual. In the metric system, you get numbers that small all the time. And the reason is that a meter is about that long. Okay, so we've got the area. Let's go ahead and bring it on home here. FL over AE. Okay, it's 350 newtons times 1 meter over 7.0686 10 to the minus 6 meters squared times, oh, I didn't give you a, this is aluminum, by the way. I forgot to write that down earlier, I apologize. Okay, so here's all the pieces put together. There's the force, the length, the area, and the elastic modulus. Now I've written all the units in here, and it's important that we track units through a problem. It can be a little cumbersome, I understand, but you're going to get the right answer more often if you track units through the problem than if you don't. If you track your units through the problem and the units come out right, the numbers will pretty much come along for the ride. If the units are right, the numbers will probably be right. If the units are wrong, the numbers will definitely be wrong. So it's a good way to check your problem, check your work. Okay, so meters squared, meters squared cancel out. Let's see, newtons there and newtons there cancel out, so I'm left with meters. Well, that's what I want. And you work this out and you get 0. Point, let's see, I'm, I'm going to get this in meters, I guess. So I'm going to get 7.073 six times ten to the minus four meters. Okay, that's about 0.7 millimeters. I'll call that 707 millimeters. Close enough. All right, so there you have it. Relatively small displacement, but you don't have a lot of force and it's a relatively small uh, structural element. If you wanted to make this displacement larger, look at what you could do. You could make the force bigger, you could make the length bigger, you could make the area smaller, which makes sense, or you could make E smaller. So there you go.